Good evening, everyone. Welcome to 49ers After Dark. We're your hosts as Jesse Naylor. I'm Grant Cohn. The Niners had their local pro day today. Kellen Mond was there. He turned heads. My head was there. It turned. I was watching him play. We'll talk about that later. But first, there are rumors about the draft. Jesse, an account with at least 30,000 followers on Twitter, said that the Niners have been inquiring about trading into the teens, 13 and 19, in case one of their top-rated players drops. We don't know which player that is. If this is true, do you think the Niners should trade up that far? First of all, what? <laughs> let's try to figure out what position it is that they would be trading up for. Realistically, what position do you think they're trading up for? I don't think it's an offensive lineman. No. I think we want it to be an offensive lineman, but I don't think it is. I could see it being a pass catcher, receiver, tight end, something like that. Mm. So I could see that. I don't know. I could see it being a defensive player. Um, although Brock Bowers, the tight end, is interesting considering how aggressive the aggressively the Niners have pursued tight ends in free agency. How they settled for Eric Sobert, who's a player, a guy, a person with a name and a face. That's him. <laughs> Will he be on the team this year? I don't know. Brock Bowers is. <clears throat> A good blocker, a good pass catcher. He went to Georgia. So did Charlie Werner. He's from Napa. I can see it. Yeah, I think Bowers. I, I also could see the Jets taking him at ten. But it, it, the report says if the player they want falls. So there's somebody in particular. Maybe Bowers is that guy. They know it's probably not likely. Either way, absolutely not. The 49ers should not do this at all because you're going to have to look. What is the cost going to be to move up? Even 19, it's probably a first, a third, and a fourth mm -hmm. minimum. To get up to 13, you're probably looking at a first this year, a first next year, a first, second, and third this year. There's no there's no way. The 49ers have 39 unrestricted free agents next year. They have to start replenishing the talent on this team, and they have to do it through the draft. You've got Brandon Ayuk that's presumably about to get paid. You already have big-time contracts on this team. Brock Purdy is going to get paid most likely. The 49ers have to figure out a way to make these drafts count. They can't trade assets like that unless they truly are saying, hey, there's a player right now that is going to put us over the top. And if that's the case, just trade a bunch of your draft picks to go get an actual legit star that you know is good already in the NFL and let it hang that way. Don't do it through the draft. All right, let me try to disagree with you on this one. Okay. The Niners have had two awful drafts in a row. Brock Purdy, notwithstanding, one of the best picks of all time. But other than him, they have Jair Brown, and that's it. And a bunch of guys who either are total busts or haven't proven themselves yet. And I think there might be a reason for that. I feel like uh, Eric DaCosta talked about it. He's the the GM of the, of the Ravens. I think the NIL and COVID has kind of changed things. Players had like fifth and sixth years of eligibility. You can stay in and make money. There's just fewer draft, like draftable players. There's 262 guys are going to get drafted, but I wonder how many draft like players teams gave draft grades to this year. Probably less in the past, and I think that might be why the Niners are striking out later in the draft, where they used to find gems. So if they need to, if they need to package a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, whatever, like fine. I don't know if you can move up to 13, but if you can move up to 19 and get someone that can make a big difference this year why not yeah but the way i look at it is you've got first round which the 49ers that's like the one round they really just don't do a good job of of picking players in or for whatever reason they they just haven't done a good job there so you're taking all of your eggs putting them in the first round basket the 49ers have had plenty of misses in and then you're saying all right well they've been good in late rounds but now they're not going to be, or it's going to be much harder because the draft really isn't that deep. And you're saying, all right, all the players you're going to draft this year, you're not going to get the second, third, and fourth round pick because you got to trade those to move up. You're going to put all the eggs in the basket of first round pick that you're not good at, and now late round picks you're not going to be good at. Your chances of just missing all the... That's why I'm saying if you're going to take all of that capital and trade it for something, go get a proven veteran in this league that you know is good. That's fair. If they were to tr trade up for Brock Bowers, it'd be hard to dislike the move because it does. He seems like the kind of player who could make an instant impact and make the team a lot better. Also, he seems like he would be a great fit with Brock Purdy. Like if Brock Purdy is your quarterback long term, 
you need like another tight end. T- George Kittle will be here a year or two more, but to have Brock Bowers as well, I think that would really bring the most out of Brock Purdy. You know, I've been talking about Brandon Ayuk. I, I, I kind of feel like Purdy doesn't necessarily have the skill set to fully take advantage of Brandon Ayuk, although he's done pretty well. He could take full advantage of Brock Bowers for sure. And to have, I mean, like Juszczyk can go to the bench. To have like a, a base offense of Bowers and Kittle and Ayuk and Debo, that's so much more dangerous with, than what they had last year. Assuming yeah, I he's mean, not... I mean, I've, I've watched Brock Bauer highlights for, a, a, you know, five minutes. So I feel very strongly about my opinion. <laughs> yeah, that's not a good point. Those five minutes and they're, they're the highlights of them. I'm sure. I mean, for sure. Every we're going to play with a catch and a big play. It was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Never absolutely. Dropped ball. That's the hard thing with these drafts is you just never know. I mean, and we'll see. It's still not too late for Pitts, but Pitts was supposed to be the bona fide tight end superstar. He's, I mean, is he even a top 10 tight end right now? I, Probably not. And he was a can't miss player coming out of Florida. Sure. So you just never know. You really never know with these guys. Generational. Yes, absolutely. Generational. That's the word people threw around. And here's yep. the thing. I think most Niner fans, if asked right now, should the Niners trade up, they'd say no. But if they do, they'd be like, yeah. <laughs> oh, they'd be super excited. Of course you'd be super excited until that player doesn't hit. And then <laughs> it's like, oh. Why did we trade up in three years? Everybody's going to hate it. Why did we do that? That was so stupid. <laughs> okay. Dante Whitner went on uh, K Adams show up in Adams. Is that what it's called? Yeah. That's a clever name. Yeah. I like Very it. clever. Okay. So Debo went on that show. No, Dante Whitner went on this show and just kind of unprompted. Maybe he was trying to make K Adams smile, blush. Maybe he thought he was being really charming or witty. I don't understand. But he started talking, making excuses, say that the Niners lost to the Chiefs and the refs and Taylor Swift, a trifecta, three against one in the Super Bowl. Fair or foul? Isn't, isn't Dante Whitner a part of like the NBC Sports deal over there? So yeah. he's, kind of, he's kind of a part of the team, right? He's an extension kind of the of. team a little bit. Yeah, kind of, in, in a roundabout way. Yeah, it's definitely foul. This is definitely foul. First of all, he's already pissed off. Chris Jones. Jones has responded and been like, y'all are full of excuses. Mm-hmm. So that there's that. You've already got a team that has owned you, and now it's like, oh, now you've given them the extra motivation, just in case you see them again in the Super Bowl so they can beat you a third time to really prove it. That's great. And Dante Whitner is not a player on this team, so he's writing, writing checks that he can't cash because he doesn't play. The other thing that he said is that if Burford makes that block, they win the game. So not only did he go out of his way and say, oh, well, they had to play against Taylor Swift and the refs and the Chiefs, but this player in particular also is the reason they lost. So yeah, which one is it? But why are you calling out players that are currently on the team? It just, I don't know. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And this is this is where it gets interesting and kind of funny when... People put a lot of stock in what X players say as if they're always right and they know everything. It's like, well, maybe we should remember things just like this when we're talking about X players' opinions and know that they are in the media. They are trying to garner some clicks and what have you as well. Maybe, just maybe, they don't always know what exactly is going on, but it, it's definitely foul. He's not even a player on the team and he's kind of an extension of the team. The question that I have, Grant, is Whitner speaking his own opinion, or is Thank this you. something that's come from inside Thank the you. building? That's you definitely what I anticipated where I was going. I was waiting to go here. It's like, yeah, Whitner can you could say Whitner's out of bounds or he was foul, but did he is this sort of the way people talk privately around the 49ers organization? It might be. Because if you remember before the Super Bowl, Jed York came out, spoke to the media. And he had a question point blank. What do you remember about the last Super Bowl? This was before they lost. I said, I remember Nick Bosa. Ha, 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 ha. It's like, that is the 49er culture. It's, yeah, we've lost a few Super Bowls, but if you really know ball, we screwed. And we don't talk about this. We're sort of losers, but if you bring up the subject, we'll talk about it very quickly. And for Dante Winter to say that that freely, it makes you wonder if he's just like, well, 
That's what Jed York said like a week ago privately. I mean, why he's not going to get mad if I say it publicly. It's not like I quoted him or anything. It just seems like something you get more of like an attaboy for saying than a, why did you do that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing, right? Like when Matt Mayoko speaks, Matt Mayoko probably not all the time is saying something on behalf of the team, but a lot of people tend to take notice when Matt Mayoko says something. It's like, okay, what's behind this? Because he's pretty plugged in. He works for NBC Bay Area. That's a partner of the 49ers and the Giants. So what does he know? And a lot of the times he does know something and he's kind of just floating things out there. That's the question with Whitner. What does he know? It's not like he's not around the team on a regular basis. I mean, he's on the field and pregames and he's consistently around the team. It's like Joe Montana, if he says something, he's not around the team all the time. But if Jerry Rice said the same thing, you'd be like, well, dude, you're there every single week. You're on the field throwing footballs. What did you hear? Right. Like there's there's different levels to it. And Whitner working for that organization, it's like, man, is this the sentiment? Because if it is, they really haven't learned any lessons over the years. None. Yeah. And it was funny when when Jed York said that like a couple months ago, when he made that joke about I remember Nick Bosa getting held. I remember thinking, you know, if and when you guys lose the next Super Bowl coming up, you're gonna say the same thing. This is what you do. It's one of the ways you cope. It's one of the ways you cope with not being champions. I mean, Whitner wasn't a champion either. Was he on the team that blew it to the against the Ravens? Yeah, he might have been. Yeah, yeah, he so. absolutely was. Yeah. So this is just generations of cope, and it's disgusting, and it comes from Jed. This is Jed's culture. This is not something that Eddie DeBartolo would have condoned. Talking like this, you know what? Who, who talks like this? Losers. So it's mm. nice that it didn't come directly from the 49ers locker room. It came from Whitner who used to be in the locker room, but it is loser talk. He even mentioned Taylor Swift. What does that even mean? What? What does that mean? Yeah. What does it even mean? Just try to explain it. No, no, no. Let's take it seriously. What did Whitner mean by that? He's ex uh, implying that the, the refs and the league wanted the Chiefs to win because Taylor Swift is dating Travis Kelsey. That's what he was implying. It's stupid. And that Taylor Swift in the big game generates more money that they can then disperse across the league. That's that's what he means. Yes, absolutely. That's crazy. I mean, that's crazy. he didn't come out and say it. He just implied it, which shows you that he didn't even want to say it. It's like, yeah, if you actually were to verbalize it, you'd be like, wow, I can't believe I just said that. So you just... Anyway... I see Dante Whitner in, in the uh, press box. I don't want to go crazy because he could go crazy on me. I just felt like this was not his finest moment. And it felt like shilling. Shilling. For a well, team one, that thing that, yeah. one thing that we do know, Grant, is the comment about Burford. That was a sentiment in the locker room because Feliciano voiced that sentiment publicly on Twitter and then apologized for it. So that that thought in particular is something that a 49er player or players have absolutely thought that if Burford doesn't miss his block, they win the game. And there are probably players that put that game on him because of that blown assignment or situation. So we know that he's voicing an opinion that certainly is true, at least in some segment of the locker room. So the question becomes, is the other portion true or is that just fodder that he's made up? I don't know. I, I'm not going to say that this is for sure what the team thinks, but man, it, it's not a good look. It's definitely not a good look because it's very close to the organization. When a, when a game comes down to the final play, it's that close. You could go back to dozens of plays and say if this one had gone differently, right? So it just seems like, again, Whitner's going along with the team narrative. Like, uh, it's Wilk's fault. It's, it's Burford's fault. It's the ref's fault. It's like all the people who don't matter. Well, what about Christian McCaffrey fumbling in field goal range. Do you have the balls to call out Christian McCaffrey? Or, or I mean, it's easy to, to point the finger at Spencer Burford. What's, what's, I mean, who the hell is Spencer Burford? But are you going to say something about Christian McCaffrey? No. I think that was a bigger mess up than Burford's. 
two guys rushing at Burford. He had to pick one, and 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 Whitner has the gall to say he picked the wrong one. Okay, now 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 criticize Christian McCaffrey for fumbling. I'd love to hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna. Oh, happen. Criticize uh, Kyle Shanahan one time. Do that. That would be so courageous uh, while working at NBC. Wow, that would be cool. Yeah, it's do not say something happen. that isn't completely the company line. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I feel well, and the other thing too is the 49ers bringing back Feliciano. I mean, they're saying that regardless, I mean, they, I'm sure it's been worked out, but that they're okay with those comments being made. You know, what's interesting is a couple weeks before the playoff started, there was an interview. I encourage people to go check it out with Richard Mendenhall and Ryan Clark and all those guys. And he talked about how hurt he was over feeling like he was the scapegoat and the reason that they lost a Super Bowl because of a fumble that he had. And there was a comment that Ryan Clark didn't even remember making, I guess, shortly after that, that was kind of a throwaway comment, but it was something that Mendenhall had held on to for all these years and finally was getting it off his chest when talking to Ryan Clark on that show. And it, it like put him in a tailspin in his life, put him in a really, really bad spot. You got to imagine... Mm-hmm. What what is what is Burford going gonna go through? At what is he, 23, 24 years old? Mm-hmm. And and he's being blamed for the whole Super Bowl? One play? Yeah. yeah. If he if he inter if he truly internalizes that and holds that, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if he'll ever be any serviceable player in this league. I'm not sure. You point the finger at Burford. What about Debo Samuel couldn't get open to save his life? What about George Kittle said hi George when a fumble was bouncing around at his ankles and he had two catches like it's just so not it's easy to point the finger at Steve Wilkes and Spencer Burford it's the easiest thing in the world sorry MMK about, why, about, why? sorry well real quick how about the whole offense being gift wrapped a turnover to start the second half and really put the game in a bad spot for the Chiefs and not even being able to move the ball whatsoever what about the special it. teams the ball falling off of Luter's foot, and then you have Ray Ray not falling on the ball, putting the defense in yet another bad spot. That's the other thing. A lot of people somehow it still has turned into as as we've moved away from the Super Bowl, more and more people are putting it on the defense. You'll hear things like, Well, I don't know, the offense left the field twice with the lead. What do you expect them to do? It's like, well, hold on a second. The yeah. defense not only gave up 19 in regulation, seven of those basically came. Because the special teams messed up. So really, they gave up like 12 points. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How is it the defense's fault? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You could point the finger at Kyle for not taking the ball second. Everyone pretty much is a, a, pretty much agrees you want the ball second so you know what to do with it. He had the ball fourth and, goal, uh, fourth and four at the nine. He could have tried to win the game or at least put it out of reach with his offense. And he said, no, I just want three points. I'm going to try to win it with my defense. Steve Wilkes, take it home. I mean, that's, those were his decisions. But now let's blame Spencer Burford and Taylor Swift. Brother uh, Bob says BA equals only player we traded up for that worked. So no. Okay. I don't think they're going to trade Brandon Ayuk. I really don't. But and you're saying Brandon you're saying trading up in it. general. He's saying don't yeah. trade up. I got it. Matt McEwen says if Jets don't take Bowers at ten, they predict he falls to early second half of the first. Hopefully Jets take Bowers. Brother Bob says Hitner can't say truth. Niners lost Super Bowl to Kyle Levy. I think if you want to become the Niners uh, play-by-play guy or, or the or the guy the color commentator, you you don't say that. Yeah. Jal says I'm from Iowa and I would 100 percent trade up for Dejean. Uh, He's an athletic freak. The problem is I think he may be the first cornerback off the board after his pro day. Yeah, I like him. Yeah, you know, I it's not that I don't like him, but. The 49ers have this issue where they draft a lot of players and expect them to play completely different positions, usually along the offensive line, and it hasn't worked out well. I don't know that I want to draft a guy that projects to be a safety that played mostly corner and just assuming it's going to work. I don't know. I don't know if I'm a big fan of that. I watched at least 10 minutes of Cooper DeGene highlights, at least. So I'm speaking from a position of extreme expertise here. But I saw him play a little nickel, a little corner, a little safety. It seems like the kind of guy um, in a zone defense, you could put him anywhere because he is smart and he's athletic and he can tackle. In man-to-man coverage, I'm not sure where he plays. Good question. 
But this is a team that wants to play zone. But you can't play zone all the time. So it's a tough one. Well, I mean, star rule. That's that's something yeah. that, uh, you know, you look at this whole thing started in, I believe, LSU made it famous. I forget where it came from. But you saw Jalen Ramsey run it with the Rams. You Maybe that's something that Staley's looking for. He probably fits that pretty well. So maybe that's maybe that is the guy that they want to go get. Who knows? Can you explain that for people that don't know exactly what that is? Yeah, it's essentially a, a hybrid. It's like a corner linebacker safety hybrid. You're playing around the line of scrimmage a ton. Uh, the guy that I, I recommend going and watching in college when he was at Baylor is Jalen Petrie. Go watch him. Jalen Petrie played that role phenomenally. It was it, it couldn't have been played any better. Maybe Cooper DeGene can fit that. Hold on. A quote from Sean Connery in The Rock. Lasers always talk about doing their best. Losers always talk about doing their best. Winners go home and... F the prom queen. <laughs> Pause. I saw that movie in theaters. It's terrifying. Great, great movie, by the way. I love that movie. Absolutely. MMK, why pause? It really wasn't a pause worthy. Yeah, it wasn't a pause worthy, no. Open message to Jed York, remove Shanahan Sr. now. Shanahan Sr. I, I wonder what he's what his involvement truly is. I'm not sure about that. I'd love to know. Uh, let's do some sleeper picks before we get back to the show because we're about halfway in, half hour in. We've got to shout out the sponsors. Big up the sponsors. Oop, that's not it. Sponsors. There we go. Okay. Let's just do basketball in general because I don't think the Warriors are playing tonight. We got okay. no, Jokic. He's very good at basketball. Kevin Durant, two guys who put the ball in the hoop. What do you think? Uh, let's Jokic, see. Got 26 and a half points for Jokic. Yeah, Durant, we got 24 there's, and a half. There's nobody that can stop Jokic. We're going more. We're going more. For Durant, it's been a little bit of a slump. You could say he's 21? doing the, yeah, twenty one, and he did that two. He, he's playing on a back to back against the who have a lot, who may not be playing because it's back, not quite. I'll go less. Okay, Anthony Edwards, Mary, Devin Booker, Aaron Gordon. Mm. Come out, order. Oh. Zoo box. That's a fun one. Zoo box. Let's do it. Double double. Oh, he's got four in a row. It's a walking day. This guy's a walking double double. I mean, Easy. how can you not Easy. say more? Yeah. How can you not say more? <laughs> Anyone else you like? I just mm. like the. Uh, are the words? Let's go. Right? Let's let's go. Less on DeRozan. They are playing tonight. No, it's Thursday. Oh, less on DeRozan. Yeah, let's, just in yeah. general. Yeah, on the points. On the points. Okay. I'm not a big DeRozan fan. It's probably because he went to USC when I was there. He also is kind of a throwback, mid-range guy. Yeah. I don't see many of those guys anymore. You know, it was better that the throwback than went to my school, Drew Holiday, who just got paid today. Yeah, he did. Four years. He's getting all up there, too. I'm surprised. Aren't we all? Aren't we all? <laughs> I'm just saying, money-wise, that's kind of crazy. Okay, Draymond Green, then we're out. Eight and a half points. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, dude, I don't. Oh, let's go. Let's go last, dude. I just, I can't. I can't <laughs> much. All right, sounds good. What did I just? No, I don't want to bet on. There we go. Pick on Barn. Oh, here we go. Jokic, Durant, Zubash, DeRozan, Draymond. Here we go. Lock it okay. in. Okay. Use that uh, promo code COHN for that deposit match up to five hundred bucks. Grant Grant's afraid he's in a pull. See how he's got that four minutes now that he's off screen. He's like, delete, delete, delete. <laughs> I don't trust it. I don't trust it. <laughs> Who's the most overpaid player in the 49ers? First, hold on. Can I can I ask you a question? Yes. Grant does this thing where it seems like my sleeper picks for whatever reason, one player every week. We're we go like four for five, and he'll just screenshot me and be like, Ah, we missed by one. Do you do that to everybody, or is that just me? You just, just make me you. feel bad. Just okay. you. Right. You right. almost, you Perfect. almost made me look smart, Jesse. Thanks. It's your fault. I thought that was a me thing. I definitely thought that was a me thing. Okay, who's the most overpaid player on the 49ers? <clears throat> well, I mean, 
there's a lot of guys making big money on this team, but there's only two guys when I look at their actual salary cap hits over the next two seasons, this upcoming season and the season after, that are in the top five paid players or cap hits for the 49ers. Those two players are Trent Williams and Debo Samuel. What's interesting about Debo Samuel is when he missed time, not last season, but the season before, the 49ers didn't skip a beat. This year, they didn't play very well with him out, but everybody neglects the fact that Trent Williams was also out for those games and just assumes that Debo is the catalyst. He's the reason. Completely forgetting that the year before he was out and they were fine. So it comes down to Debo and Trent. Well, Trent is the best in the world at his position. I don't think that that guy can be overpaid. So I have to go with a guy that I would say definitely a top 10 weapon in this league, but he's paid as a receiver and he's not a top 10 receiver anymore. So I would go Debo Samuel is the most overpaid player on this team. I think that let's talk about Trent Williams for a second because he does make a lot of money and he is going to turn 36 in July. And it's scary to have that much money tied up in a 36 year old football player. Because he misses games every year as is. Two, three, four. What if what if this year he misses nine? Like, remember in 2019, we're out of nowhere. Joe Staley just missed nine games. And never really, I mean, he had never done anything like that before. But it happens. He goes 35. He was only 35. And that happened. Mm-hmm. So all these, I mean, he's the only player, player they're paying on their offensive line. If he goes down for half a season... The season's over. The season's over. So that's all the more reason for them to draft an offensive tackle. Like, they need three. If they... See, that that's where it's tough. Because you're right. You you are right. If if Debo goes down for half the season, I think they can, they can make it through. Like, if he misses mm-hmm. nine games, I could see them going six and three. If Trent goes down for nine games, they'll be, they'll be lucky to go four and five. And that's why I can't put him as the most overpaid. But now in hindsight, if you look back and say, all right, he missed those games and Debo didn't, it's like, well, yeah, I mean, you paid him all this money and he wasn't there. But the importance of Trent Williams is just, it's too much right now. The 49ers, you're right, are relying on his health a bit too much. And it is worrisome because if he goes down, who else? I mean, who who else on that team is a, a very good lineman? They don't no. have it. It doesn't exist. They don't have it. So I think you have an opportunity this year. Um, you saw what Mel Kuyper Jr. projected the Niners to take. Uh, Roger Rosengarten. Rosengarten. Yep. It's interesting. I mean, when you look at him, he's mostly projected to go in round two, maybe even round three. But then you dig in a little bit deeper. Uh, he really did a good job at the combine. He's like the fastest offensive lineman in the draft. You compare his combine numbers to Joe Staley's, who was a late first round pick. They're similar. He's working with Joe Staley. He was coached by Ed McCaffrey. Seems like he's got the Niners written all over him. And if you see him as a starting offensive tackle, you probably want that fifth-year option. So, I don't know. That seems like a prob- like, like a, a, a possible pick there. Yeah, it definitely does. I mean, there's ties to the team for sure. I mean, they've got some insight as far as him go. But the thing was is that he's just climbing it. This is the other hard part about draft boards. We look at it and we do all these mocks and we think that we've got it figured out. And then a team quote unquote reaches and we're like, why are they reaching? Well, that's because their boards are very different than what PFF or whatever says. So they're going to go and reach for this player. And maybe that player ends up being really good. And we look silly thinking that they were a third round prospect, but really teams looked at him at the back end of the first round. Rosengarten, at least very early on was like third round fourth round very early on in the process he's climbed and when mel kuyper said a month ago that he thought that that was going to be the pick now it doesn't seem so crazy because a lot of people seem to like him and the, he definitely seems like a 49er but he was a right tackle last year mm. so are the 49ers willing to start him at right tackle and then move him over i think he was a right tackle if i'm not he mistaken. certainly was now yeah. he was a right tackle on a team with a quarterback who was, was a left-handed. left-handed quarterback that's true True. Yes. Now, he probably, I mean, we know he was looked at as a second or third rounder before the combine. Then he did a great job at the combine. It would have been interesting to look back and see what Joe Staley's draft stock was in 
late March or early May of 2007. I mean, he went to Central Michigan. How many people knew who the hell that 306-pound offensive tackle was who used to be a tight end who ran a 4-7? He did run a 4-7. I mean, that guy was an athletic freak. And Rosengarten isn't quite like that. You know, he ran a 4-9. He didn't put up as many bench press reps, but, I mean, he's a whole lot better of an athlete than Colton McKivitz, put it that way. And in Washington, they threw the ball a lot. They used a lot of empty formations, empty backfields, which the Niners tried to do in the Super Bowl with not a lot of success. He's been running outside zone since high school. I really wouldn't be surprised. Again, it doesn't have to be him, but it seems like this is supposed to be such a historically good class of offensive tackles. The the 11th best offensive tackle in this draft could be better than Colton McKibbitts. I don't see how you just pass on it. I think this is what we talked earlier about trading up. I'm starting to kind of resign to the fact that maybe trading back is the right decision. I think trading back four, five, six spots early into the second round, getting more picks, allowing them to be be able to maneuver the draft a little bit better and use those picks to maybe move up from that late second round or that third round and get get a guy that they really like. And I think there's going to be multiple guys there early in the second round that could fit their needs. Newbin might be there. I think he's a good safety. They got some tackles. There's some options. I think 31 is an interesting spot to take an offensive tackle because it's the like almost the latest you can take a guy and get the fifth year option. So it's mm-hmm. like the almost as cheap as a first round pick could be. And right tackles are really offensive linemen are really expensive. Like look at the problem the Niners have right now with Aaron Banks coming up. He's going to be due for an extension after this year. And that means, well, he's due for an extension now. But they've got four years of them. They redshirted him one year. Next year, even if he doesn't go to a Pro Bowl, he could get $100 million, the way offensive line, starting offensive linemen are getting paid. And so he'll be gone. Whereas if they had taken him at 31 or 32, they could have him on a fifth-year option at cheaper than whatever he could get on the market. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe that's one reason. Which, although, yeah, you're probably passing on much better. So do what they do. Do you? Do you think if Aaron Banks was drafted in the first round, they'd pick up his fifth year option? It's tough, right? It's a bl- McGlinchey's. It's true. You know, that's why that's what made me think of it. Maybe not. Maybe they would think about it. Is Kendrick Bourne recruiting Brandon Ayuk to the Patriots? He definitely is trying. He's definitely trying. He actually posted, I think it was on his IG, one of his IG stories or whatever mm. that, uh, he wants Brandon Ayuk to come. He's like, hey, come come be a Patriot. And the Patriots are probably going to draft a quarterback at three or at least presumably are going to draft him at three. The question becomes, is there a feasible trade for Brandon Ayuk if he were to go to the Patriots? Because they have the number three overall pick. Unless they trade back, I think it might be pretty tough. But I was looking at it, Grant. The Patriots have pick 34 and 68 as well. If they were to trade that, I know it's not as sexy as a first round pick, but they're just outside the first round, which we just talked about. That might be a good thing to trade back. Get pick 34 and 68. You know, that's equivalent to pick 21, Mm. according to draft charts. So Mm. you're essentially getting a first round pick out of them. The Steelers were, we don't know for sure, but presumably offering pick 20. Well, pick 21 is right there. So it's right in the wheelhouse. I'd take, I, I would be interested in 34 and 68. If they were for sure going to trade Brandon Ayuk, I probably would almost rather have 34 and 68 than I would pick 21 anyways. Give me two shots at it. So that that's a possibility. That's an option that they could offer. Now, again, I don't think Ayuk's going anywhere, but, you know, they get Jaden Daniels, who's a friend of Brandon Ayuk, and, uh, you know, he's got Kendrick Bourne over there. Maybe, maybe he would. Maybe just say, you know what, send me to the Patriots. I don't know. Right, and from the Patriots' perspective, if they get Jaden Daniels, they could say, one, we're going to have a starting quarterback on a rookie deal for the next four years. Um, so we can absolutely afford Brandon Ayuk. I mean, Brandon Ayuk, we could pay him $30 million a year and just pretend we're paying, uh, paying it on a quarterback. So they could do it. And they could also say, well, this is the kind of player that would really ensure that Jaden Daniels succeeds because he's a great wide receiver and they're friends. So I could absolutely see why the Patriots would want him. And it seems like that'd be a great spot for the Niners because you'd never have to worry about Brandon Ayuk again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. You, I mean, yeah. you see him, what, once every four years or whatever? You don't have to worry yeah, about it. you're not going to see him in the Super Bowl. So yeah. enjoy. 
Gosh. I think I think Jaden Daniels is going to go to Washington, most likely. So I don't know if that works. But but from the Patriots standpoint, it doesn't really matter. If you go young quarterback, regardless of who it is, mm-hmm. it still makes sense to get a Brandon Ayuk. It makes sense from their aspect. Now, if it's not Jaden Daniels, I think it starts to make less sense for Brandon Ayuk personally. Maybe all of a sudden he wouldn't want to go over there. For the 49ers, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if any trade for Brandon Ayuk makes a ton of sense, but if he's asking for $27, 28000000 million, maybe it does. I don't know. This is going to be interesting. It's going to be an interesting time. I, I do think that they get in and out of this draft without trading him, but golly, man, it's it's there's enough smoke there where I'm a little bit nervous as a Brandon Ayuk fan. Well, here's, I think, the question. It's just a business question. How many teams have a top five highest paid quarterback a top five highest paid wide receiver and a top 10 highest paid wide receiver that's a trifecta of expensiveness how many teams do that none right now none. so the Niners could be one or they could say you know what we love Brandon Ayuk we wish we hadn't paid Debo Samuel we did pay Debo Samuel we can't get out of the Debo Samuel contract or they could extend Brandon Ayuk and trade Debo next year. Maybe that would make more sense. Yeah, that I, that's the other thing. I, I know that we talked about Bowers earlier. I wouldn't be shocked if the 49ers love a receiver and, and go and get that guy and then get rid of Debo next year either. You know what I mean? Like I, I can see that happening as well. The 49ers are just, they're wild, man. They're, they're unpredictable at times. Whenever you think you've got it figured out, it's like, no, 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 no. You think we're zigging? Yeah, we're going to zag. We're absolutely trading everything we got and going and getting what we think is an elite wide receiver and pairing him with Brandon Ayuk. Sayonara, Debo. You got one more year with us. Jeez, man. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I would kind of understand it. It's not like Debo Samuel is going to be is getting better or he's going to be elite in two years. This might. I mean, he's already past his prime. If we're being brutally honest here, he's still a vex. He's still an excellent player, but he's past his prime, and he's only going to go one direction from here. So. Trade him next year. Get his replacement now. Yeah. Or get his replacement next year. Either way. Kendrick Bourne. David. Recru- you're recruiting the wrong guy. You <laughs> Go get Debo. He's your guy. Yeah. Uh, Fish and Chip says, overpaid quarterback Kyle Shanahan. Check out the mansion. Overpaid? Mm. Overpaid it, man. Matt McEwen says, what do you guys think of Zach Frazier second round? Is that... I don't know. It's the center. It's the center. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I the only center that I really love in this draft, Jackson Powers Johnson. That's just me personally. Um I Frazier might be really good, but I'd rather have Jackson Powers Johnson. Okay. Last topic of the day, and I think this one is interesting. Local pro day. Mostly for Draft eligible players, players who hadn't been in the league, guys who went to Stanford, Cal, San Jose State, high school around here, those kind of guys. And Kellen Mond. The 49ers put out an invitation to Kellen Mond, who was a third round pick in 2021. He was on the Vikings for a year. He's been on a few practice squads. He was on the Colts practice squad last year. It was a full on tryout for the guy. And I watched it. And I mean, I'm not going to act like I can 100% assess a quarterback based on how he warms up. Uh, he did have a few errant throws, doesn't every quarterback. It's, he said he's changing his his mechanics and he's working with receivers he's never worked with before. Fine. It looked like he was aiming the ball a little bit. But still, I like the idea of Kellen Mond on this team. I think he showed enough in college. Uh, forget what he showed. What do you know about him? He's been in the league. He's been in practice squads. I think he's going to be further along than any quarterback you draft in round six or round seven. And if you sign him now, when he gets to learn the playbook and be here for OTAs and minicamp, I think it's highly likely that he ends up being better than Brandon Allen, and he could be a third-string quarterback for your team. And he has a sort of similar skill set as Josh Dobbs. Uh I kind of like it. I thought it was really interesting on the Niners' part. I think it's cool that they're considering it, and I think they should go for it. I feel like Kellen Mond starting a game <laughs> this season. It's like the revenge arc that, that needs to happen for Grant Cohn. Not even because Purdy got injured, 
But just because like maybe like last year they clinched the final final week of the regular season and they're just going to play their backups. And it's like, ah, we could play Dobbs or, you know what, Dobbs isn't going to be here next year. Kellen Mond might. Let's just play Kellen and see what he's got. <laughs> That's exactly what we need. I would love it. But Kellen Mond, man, I agree. That's exactly what I was going to say. Could you see Kellen Mond having a career much like Dobbs? I certainly could. Yes. How long did it take for Dobbs to catch on? How many years did was he in, in and out of this league? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So and what's I don't about know. Mod is he's 24. I mean, he's younger yeah. than or as young as a lot of quarterbacks that are in the draft this year. And the yeah. experience he has is in the NFL on multiple practice squads. He's been on a team that runs a very similar system as the Niners. It's intriguing. It is intriguing. It is intriguing. And the, the way that I look at it is last year, I think Allen was important on this team. I do because Brock Purdy was in his first full year starting. A lot of young quarterbacks talk about how that second and really even the third quarterback helped them a ton as far as game planning and studying and all of those things. Well, Purdy's now a, a bit of a veteran. He knows what to expect in this league. He's going to have a full offseason for the first time in his career. I think he's got a good grasp of what's going on. So why not just go with the guy that actually could possibly do something at some point in this league? And even if Kellen Mond, let's say Kellen Mond turns some heads during the preseason and you keep him on the team, and then next year he's your backup. You can promote him and keep him for cheap. That would be worth it. Allen should never be your backup quarterback and doesn't have the upside to ever truly be your backup quarterback. Let him at least compete with Allen. I don't see any harm in that. I'm intrigued. I'm certainly intrigued, yeah. yes. And the thing with Allen is, like, he's someone you want in your quarterback room. He's good in practice. He's good at meetings, but you don't want him in a game and he's in his thirties and there's no a potential there. He just seems like a coach at this point, a coach with a Jersey. And I think you could do better than that. Bringing it. Well, we've been talking about the Niners need to draft a quarterback. Well, if they draft a quarterback, it's not going to be in round one or two or three or four or five. It's going to be late. And maybe they'll get the next Brock Purdy, or maybe they'll get a guy who's behind Kellen Mond in terms of development and less talented, like, we're talking about a guy who doesn't even count toward the 53 man roster. Does the third string quarterback count toward the 53 man roster? No, I mean, they're practice squatted. And no, yeah. you get the emergency guy. You get the emergency yeah. guy. So I mean, he's like barely, he's not even there. Why not? I yeah, I would think so. And you could also draft an undraft, you could sign an undrafted free agent if you wanted to, but I just don't see how it seems like a better option. I like it. <laughs> yeah, I would say I would I say like so. It. And yeah. and I and he's closer to the skill set of even your starting quarterback than Allen is. Allen, mm -hmm. what does Allen bring that Brock Purdy does? I mean, anything, anything close to it? No, I think Mon can bring a little, at least the mobility. I don't know. To me, it's it's worth it. Kick the tires on him. And worst case scenario, you even if you draft a quarterback in round six, Kellen Mon's going to be like the same price. Not like you're going to pay him big time money. Bring him in as a camp body. Let's see what what happens. And if he beats out Allen, he beats out Allen. Great. If not, if he's just garbage, then move on from it. But why not? Yeah, he's going to be as young as most of these guys coming out anyways. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, say you, you signed Josh Dobbs for a one-year deal, right? He's yeah. going to be a free agent next year. You got to start developing the next guy. Yeah. And they, they played together on the Browns. Could work. I think so. Could work. I think so. Kind of like it. Julio, what did, what did, did, you, did you see T.O.? T.O. and his son there today? What did you think? I saw T.O.'s son. T.O.'s son talked. He was extremely nice. Uh, just the nicest kid. I don't want to call a grown man a kid, but he's, you know, he's not even in the NFL yet. Just the nicest guy. And what was kind of cool was Terrell Owens was there too, watching his son. I thought that was kind of touching. Uh, he also looked like he was in phenomenal shape and would probably be the best player on the field if they would have let him yeah. per participate. Yeah, I I probably he would. was also that wearing was a full sweatsuit, and it was at least 80 degrees. Yeah. But a lot of football players do that, especially guys from the South. Like, they'll come to the to California, and it'll be like a dry 80 degrees, and they'll be like, this is cold. I'm sorry. I need... This is ridiculous. I'm from Florida. I'm from Tennessee. This is not <laughs> heat. Not what I'm used to. This is not heat. Julio, thank you for being a member for 28 months. Uh, Jay says, do you think the defense will return to form before Wilkes? Well, Wilkes doesn't have a job. 
so no like will it w- will it bounce back to the level it was in 2020 oh before wilkes oh i thought you were saying like who's <laughs> bounce back wilkes or the defense i'm like well wilkes isn't even in the league <laughs> so i'll go on the defense i don't know yeah. yeah uh no no i don't no there's too much turnover too much the the coaching changes the i don't even know who the coordinator is you're bringing in a bunch of new pieces greenlaw might not start the year. Hafunga might not start the year. I, no, no, I don't, unfortunately. Mm-mm. Yeah, I don't either. Matt McEwen. Also, the defense wasn't great in Salah's first year or D'Amico's first year. They all hit their stride later on. Later on. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Which is uh, why maybe the Niners should have gave St- Steve Wilkes some grace. But Matt McEwen, if we sign Mon, Grant is going to have a party. I already had a party. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just the fact that he was there is enough. He's like, well, he's pretty much already a 49er. I called it. Yeah, you're welcome. Julio, what's up, Grand Jesse? Hope all's well. What's up, Julio? What's up, Julio? Uh, I guess we got a, a little bit of a shorter show. Nothing's really going on these days. The Niners have a, a draft in two weeks from tomorrow. So things are ramping up. We're going to have Roger Rosengarten to talk about soon. You know why I think Roger Rosengarten was, is, is a late riser? Kind of weird name. Kind of sounds Jewish. Rosengarten. I'm just saying. What's people that? are like, draft a Jewish right tackle, but then he ran a four nine two, and it's like, okay, I'll, fine. Rosen. I bet he's not Jewish though. But I'm just saying, he might be. You never. Wasn't know. that the last name of the? Remember the movie uh, Rookie of the Year? Like broke his arm. Yeah, was it his was. Name? It was Rosengarten, right? I, know why. <laughs> I don't know why I remember that, but I'm pretty sure it was Rosengarten. I think you're right, like Henry. Henry Rosengarten, I think. I think you're absolutely 100% right. QC, if your pop was a film <laughs> critic instead, where are you at? Ooh. That's a good question. I'm really happy he wasn't a film critic. He almost was. Are you criticizing film? I might have been. Might have been. <laughs> there you go. Are you at the Sundance every year? Like it's the combine just getting jacked? I'm waiting for the uh, U.S. release of Robot Dreams. Have you, have you heard of this movie? Looks dope. No, I haven't. Uh-uh. It's, about, it's about it's an animated movie set in the '80s of New York, and it's about a, a dog who builds a robot, and they become best friends. Best friends. <laughs> it's a buddy. It's a buddy flick, and it, it probably has a, a, a sad end. It kind of reminds me a little of Toy Story mm-hmm. Three, which is one of the greatest movies of all time. And I, sometimes I just watch it when I want to ball my eyes out. Toy Story Three. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that dog probably doesn't make it. I don't want to watch it. I'm already sad. The dog or the robot? I don't know. Either way. Are we gonna become emotionally attached to the robot? I think we are. Yeah, probably. It's a good call. Yeah, that's what happens. Anyway, are you done streaming for the night? I am, yeah, yeah. I'll be back tomorrow with uh Marco Martinez. He's good. Up and coming up and coming content creator. He's been around for a while. Make sure you Forever, watch dude. that show. It's gonna be good. Absolutely. Thank you, Grant. Thanks, Jesse. See you guys.